Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, my God. Thank you for all that you have done in our life last week, preserving us, keeping us, providing for us, protecting us. Lord, I thank you for your grace upon myself, healing my neck. I thank you for my brother Mauricio. We rebuke that migraine, Father. Thank you for healing, restoration, and grace and peace upon everybody. I thank you for giving us understanding today. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and bear witness with power and glory about our Father's kingdom and our King Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. You are the teacher. Come and teach, illustrate, make your kingdom plain, Father, and, and plain to us, simple to us to understand. And give us a word for this season, what we should do with our life and how do we function. And we give you all the glory and praise. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, my friends, for being here. I, as I was praying, the Holy Spirit put something in my heart. You know, there is a divine dissatisfaction, discontentment going on globally in people's heart. Many countries are at the brink of implosion or a revolution or whatever you want to call it, whether it is here in the United States, Nigeria, Liberia, you name it. M many of the countries, people are unhappy, unfulfilled, and they're just waiting for something to happen. They're waiting for change. And this world system, the Babylonian system that we depend and live for, live with, will collapse and must collapse, actually, so that God's kingdom can manifest. So we need to learn how to transition into God's kingdom in this season. That is the season. That is the reason God loved this global pandemic. You know, people blame the devil for all kinds of things, but devil cannot move his pinky if God doesn't say go. <laughs> devil is not that powerful. Devil works under authority, authority of God. And we see that in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, before Jesus defeated the devil, devil has to go and get a permit from God to do something in Job's life in the Old Testament so much more in the new testament because jesus said all authority to rule has been given unto me in heaven and on earth and devil has none sometimes we ascribe so much power and authority to the devil he has the only power and authority what people ascribe to him he has nothing left so we need to learn this is the season of transitioning into God's kingdom. That's why you are here in this particular course. We wouldn't be taking this course last year. Why? Or the year before. It is for now. You have been selected, appointed by God to hear this gospel of the kingdom because 2021 onwards, it's going to be an year of transitioning into the kingdom. That is the word for 2021. 2020 was changing, shaking, and all those things to come to an end. And God gave us a divine pause so we can deliberately, he gave us an opportunity, golden opportunity to transition into our kingdom assignment. So please don't take that lightly. Please don't take the season lightly. Don't wait for things to go back to normal because it's not going to go back to normal. This is the time for us to be busy with our Father's business on earth, whatever that may be, whether it's ministry, business, uh, whatever you're called to do in God's kingdom, you need to find it out, make sure of it, and step into it. Sooner that we do it, the better it is. So that is the beginning word for all of us.
for this class, not just for this class, for every body of Christ around the world. So today we are going to start by thinking, what is kingdom? We are talking about discovering the lost kingdom. Before we go out and seek God's kingdom, as Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. What is kingdom? Is it power? Is it miracle? Is it casting out demons? Is it uh, um, some kind of feelings or experience? What is God's kingdom? Kingdom simply means kingdom is a country. We have natural kingdoms on the earth today, United Kingdom and many other kingdoms around the world. Kingdom is a country or a nation or a territory ruled by a king. If there is no king, there's no kingdom. There's no territory, there's no kingdom. So simply kingdom means king's domain. Our God is a king. He has a kingdom. It is a country called the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is a place much more real than the natural world we live in. So it is a country. Every time you think about a kingdom or God's kingdom, it is God's country. It is not a feeling. It's not an experience. It's not a gift. It's not just power. It has all those things, but much more. Every kingdom has power. Every kingdom has its own. And we are going to learn more about it today. And every kingdom has 12 major components. Why number 12? Because 12 is the number of government in the Bible. Anything God does in relation to his kingdom and its government, it has to be number 12 has to be attached to it. That's why there were, there were 12 tribes in the Old Testament, 12 disciples, apostles in the New Testament, and 120 people in the upper room waiting for the arrival of the kingdom. And 120 is 10 times 12. And on the day of Pentecost, after Peter was preaching, 3,000 people were saved. 3,000 is 250 times 12. And there were 24 elders in heaven. They are the government of God, helping God govern the whole universe. So anything that has to do with God, 12 months, that is in a year, you know. So God has a calculation and a numerology about everything he does. So the number one component of a kingdom is king. If there's no king, king, there's no kingdom. And our God is eternal, is an eternal king that we learned last week. Then every kingdom and a king needs a governing body. In the Bible days, when you read about when a king has a problem in his country, he'll call the elders of the land. They were his governing body. There will be elders in his palace that he counsel with and take care. Uh, if there's a problem in the kingdom, he will call his elders to find out solution and come up with solution and send them to solve that problem. So every kingdom has a governing body. In God's kingdom, his governing body is called ecclesia or what we call it church. Church supposed to be governing God's kingdom or administering God's kingdom on the earth. Like United States has a governing body called the Congress. India has parliament. Israel has Neset. And in Denmark, I don't know what you call it, but whatever you call your governing body in Netherlands, that is the governing body. So God's kingdom is a country. He's a king. He has a governing body. And that's what the church is supposed to be doing. But that's not how we were taught. We were taught religion instead. Go to church, sing three songs, hear a sermon, then go out to lunch. That is no church. That is a religious club. If we are not governing anything in our community, if we are not administering anything, then we are not functioning as an ecclesia. The third component of a kingdom is family or people. In God's kingdom, we relate with our king as his family. Many times when you ask people why God created mankind and put us on the earth, and people say he wanted a family. No, 
That's not the purpose. Purpose is Genesis 126. Family is how we relate with God. God wanted to be our father. That's why we call him our father. That's how we relate with him as sons and daughters of God. He doesn't want any rituals in between. Nothing in between. And it took me more than 30 years to, to learn to relate with God as my father because of the father wounds I have from my natural father. I think I shared with you before, I couldn't talk to my father face to face. Never, not even once. Never heard a positive affirmation from my natural father. Only criticism, punishment, abuse, beatings, and emotional, physical, you name it. So when I came into God's kingdom, I began to look at God as I saw my earthly father. And it was terrifying. I felt like an insect held by God on top of a uh, burning fiery furnace. Anytime I do wrong, he's going to drop me into that fire, the lake of fire. And that was my, and I was in ministry. And it took me a long time to get healed of that father wound that came into my life for 18 years, the first 18 years of my life. Terrorized to my life, actually, my childhood. So many people struggle in how to relate with God as their, their daddy, as their father. It's not easy. And it's the enemy's number one weapon is to skew the perception of God in an individual. The purpose of parenting is to model the heart and the nature of God to our children. So when they become of age, we release them to their real father, the heavenly father. That is the purpose of parenting. But if there is one thing messed up on this planet earth is parenting and marriage. Somebody say amen. It's not a good amen, but that is the truth. That's the fact. Because the enemy knows if he can mess somebody up when they are little. That's what he did to Adam and Eve. The moment God put them in the garden, he came in the beginning and put a lie, a misconception about God, sowed into their spirit man. And Adam and Eve believed it. And that's where the problem began in our life to twist the perception of God as somebody not good enough, somebody who is evil, somebody who can't trust with our life. So we go out like the prodigal son did, or the other group goes and work, 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 work like the older brother of the prodigal son. Even though he was a son, he was working like a slave, expecting something from the father. He didn't get anything. And the younger son, he ran away from the father's house. It's not the problem with the father. It was their perception of their father. The father was perfect. He never punished them, never scolded them, never did anything evil. That's the way our God is. He never did anything evil to us. But mankind developed this evil concept about God because of the poison that was injected by the serpent into the first man called Adam and Eve and his wife. So God wanted a family, his kingdom business on earth, a family business on earth. He is in heaven. We have access to him, access to heaven, access to Mount Zion. He made heaven and earth, put it inside our spirit man. Everything we are looking for somewhere out there, he already deposited into our spirit man. It is in us. It's not somewhere out there. Your destiny is in you. He put the purpose in you. He put the kingdom of God within you. Christ is in you. Holy Spirit is in you. Jesus said in John chapter 14, 23, the Father and I, I will come and make our home with him. The Father is in us. The Son is in us. The Holy Spirit in us. The kingdom of God is in us. Mount Zion in us. What else do we need? <laughs> But we are still acting like we are some, missing something. And we are looking somewhere out there. We have to reach and grab it. No, it's in you. 
I heard a preacher say, everything a tree need to become, it's already deposited in that seed. Inside of that seed, everything that tree needs to become. It needs to be planted at the right environment. When you pl become planted in the right environment with the right community of people, my dear people, we are not supposed to be lone lane ranchers in God's kingdom. We are supposed to be a family. But nobody wants to be connected with anybody. Everybody's trying to build their own kingdom. Everybody's trying to be, everybody's so busy trying to accomplish something. I can't do this by myself. I was talking to a brother who came here helping you with certain things. He said, I can't do this by myself. We're supposed to be as a family. And every cult, every kingdom, every country has a culture. If you travel from United States to Netherlands, you have a different culture. From Netherlands to Dubai, they have a different culture there. Their ladies will walk around with a burqa covered in their faces. Men wear long, uh, whatever. You know, then if you come to India, you will see something else different in India. <laughs> so when I came to the United States, I had to learn the culture of this country. And I have, I have a funny story, actually. When I came here first, you know, in India, what we eat, curry, Chicken curry, fish curry, everything is curry in India. And rice is the main dish. So when I came to the United States, I couldn't taste a thing. Oh, my goodness. It tasted like something. <laughs> I couldn't drink the orange juice. I couldn't drink the milk because it's so different than what we used to get in India. And, and one day, my principal of the Bible school that I came invited a bunch of kids students to their home for dinner. So I went there expecting some chicken curry and rice, right? <laughs> so when I went there, the table was all set nice and nice fork and everything was ready. We sat there and you know what they brought first? A, a bowl full of green grass. <laughs> oh my God, I said, what is this? I'm not holy cow from India, I don't eat grass. What I didn't know was here people before they have dinner, they eat salad. That is part of the meal here. In India, we didn't, we never ate salad like that before. So I had to learn. I had to change the way I ate, what I ate, how I drove, what I talked, how I talked. Oh my Lord, my God. It's a whole different world. The same way when you come into God's, God's kingdom, Kingdom of God has its own culture, its own diet, its own language, its own way of thinking and manners and all the things that you see in our natural country, kingdom of God has. Unfortunately, most people when they come into God's kingdom, they don't adapt to the culture of God's kingdom. They come in with their old culture they grew up in racism, caste system, tribalism, all this part of our earthly culture in God's kingdom, culture, there's no racism, there's no tribalism, there's no caste system. We are children of the same family, one family, one king, one kingdom, citizens of God's kingdom. The earth, God's kingdom culture says, if you want to receive, give first. But in our culture says you take and keep what you have. God's kingdom culture says love your enemies. Our culture that we grew up says slap them upside down first. <laughs> so that's the difference between God's kingdom culture and the culture we grew up in. Everything is different, opposite. Number fifth component of God's kingdom is decree. Every time, any time the king speaks something, it becomes the law of the land. Nobody can change it. Nobody can debate it. No argument. It is set. 
Like the Bible says, God created us male and female. Nobody can change that. There's no you know, argument. There's no debate. There's no 52 genders. Two genders, God created male and female. And man began to play with, to change the fundamental laws of God. And we are asking God for trouble. Number six component is army. Every kingdom needs an army. In our case, angels of God. We are also soldiers of Christ. But much more than that, millions of angels are waiting to execute the decrees of God in heaven. And each of you have at least two angels. He charges his angels over you so that you won't dash your foot against a stone. Territory. Every kingdom needs a territory, whether spiritual or natural. As kingdom citizens, I would encourage you at some point in time, when you can, buy a piece of land for God's kingdom, territory on the earth. And invite Jesus to come and rule and reign over that piece of land. Give him the jurisdiction over that area. Because land is very important. Every kingdom used to fight in the olden days. Do you know what they used to fight for? Land. I can't tell you enough, my dear people of God. I can't tell you enough how much God cares about the land. He told the people of Israel, if you mess up the land that I have given you, I will wipe you out of the land and kick you out to the four corners of the earth. Then I asked God a question which I won't answer you. I asked God, Lord, do you care about the land more or the people? <laughs> you answer that yourself. If we don't take care of the land that God gave to us, we are asking for trouble. That's what the parable Jesus said, a noble man went to a far country to receive his kingdom. He gave his vineyard to his servants to take care of it. And they messed it up. Education, number eight component of a kingdom is education. There's a huge difference between world's education and kingdom education. When we were born to this planet Earth, when we were little, our parents began to teach us things how to do. We didn't come to this Earth knowing to do anything. We didn't know how to brush our teeth. We didn't know how to put our shoes on our feet. We didn't know nothing. Everything we know was taught to us. Then when we became five or six years of age, we went to school for the next 12 long years. Remember those days? Five days a week, nine months a year. For 12 years, we spent to finish a high school. Then after that, some of us went to college, maybe another three or four more years. So 15 years, we went to learn the Babylonian system to learn how to survive so that someday we will get a job to make enough money so we can make a living. That is the world's system or education. Kingdom education is different. Kingdom education starts with your identity first. Who am I? Then it's, it goes to the next step. Where did I come from? My soul. Then it goes to the next step. Why am I here? My purpose. That is the foundation of kingdom education. Then it helps us discover our calling and the gifts and the potentials God has deposited in us, then you develop it and release you to go and fulfill God's assignment. That is kingdom education. And the truth is, just like we spent 15 years learning about this world system and God's creation, when you come into God's kingdom, you have to spend time. You don't have to spend 15 years. I did more than 15 years, God's kingdom, how to learn, learning how God's kingdom operates. But now you don't because somebody else have those information, the books that is written, courses have been made ready. But you still need, when you're born again, the first thing 
we should be taught is about God's kingdom. Because Jesus said, John chapter 3, verse 3, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom. The first thing that needs to happen to a person when they're born again is to see the kingdom of God. And the next day, we had to enroll ourselves onto the kingdom school. Not taught us how to sing three songs on a Sunday morning. We had to be taught on God's kingdom and our assignment in it. If we can spend 15 years learning to survive on this planet Earth, let us spend at least three years, just like the disciples did with Jesus, dedicate ourselves, committed to learn God's kingdom and our assignment in it. I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. Kingdom economy. Every kingdom has an economy. Again, there's a difference between world's economy and God's kingdom economy. This world's economy that is run on money depends on God's kingdom economy. This world's economy uses the materials and raw materials that God has created to make money. That's the difference between world's economy and kingdom economy. There's no recession in God's kingdom economy because the wealth and riches and resources God has created on this planet Earth, nobody has taken it out of this earth. It is still here. It's only changed locations and hands. Nobody can take them out of here. Every gold that God deposited in Genesis when he said it is good, it is still here. Every diamonds he created, every stone, precious stone he created, it's still here. And we had to go to some treasury, some, some vault, open it and see the, the, the plates of gold they have stocked up in some federal banks of the world, some countries. Oh my goodness. Business, the next component of kingdom is business. Every kingdom need business and industries. There is kingdom business, there is Christian business. Christian business is a Christian who's doing a business who pays tithe and offerings. But a kingdom business is an idea that God releases to somebody to expand his kingdom. That business exists for the purpose of expanding his kingdom, not with the motive of making money. Media, 11th component of a kingdom is media. Media means the method or mode of communication. In the Bible days, it was teaching and preaching and writing. Now we have social media, we have TV, we have internet, uh, hundreds of ways of communication we have. And the 12th, the last but not the least, agriculture. Oh, this is so important, my people of God. God was the first farmer on this planet Earth. God came down and planted a garden. Why did God himself came down to plant the garden? Why didn't he appoint two angels? They would have said, hey guys, go and throw a bunch of seed out there, put some trees, create a garden for Adam, let him figure it out. <laughs> no, that's not what he did. God himself came down, planted the garden. Do you know why? The word planted in Hebrew in Genesis means establish. God came down not to just plant a garden as we think of with the trees and butterflies and puppies. He came to establish his kingdom on the earth. That was the prototype of his kingdom. When it comes to God's kingdom, he gets involved personally. He wants to make sure it is exactly done the way he wanted because it is kingdom launching on planet Earth. The first institution that God implemented on this planet Earth that was God's kingdom, but in God's kingdom, it was agriculture, not family, not marriage. 
That was the last thing he did. Why agriculture is so important? Because that's what sustains life. That's what keeps us alive. He wanted food to be our medicine, not medicine to be our food. Would you trust our enemies to make food for you? Even presidents or kings travels to other countries. Do you know what they do? They take their food and their chef with them because they don't trust those countries to make their food and their water. They take their things, their personal chef, and they taste it before they eat it. But we have given everything to the hands of the enemy and told them, okay, you manufacture it, we will eat it. <laughs> oh, take the whole world. And the devil took the world. Take the agriculture, he took it. Take the education, he took it. We need kingdom farming. Every family need a garden behind their backyard. <laughs> Every family need a garden. Agriculture. Oh, I can't emphasize enough. My Lord, my God. That is God's heart. Now the question is, what is the difference between kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven? This is a very debated subject. <laughs> you know, people come up with all sorts of definitions and confuse them. They have no idea what they're talking about. It's very simple. Matthew is the only gospel writer who uses the phrase kingdom of heaven in the whole four gospels. And there is a specific reason for it. Everybody else uses only kingdom of God. So the first one, kingdom of God, means it reveals to whom the kingdom belongs. Ownership. Like kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a king in Babylon in the Bible days. So when you say kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar means the kingdom that belongs to Nebuchadnezzar. So when you say kingdom of God means the kingdom that belongs to God. That is ownership. And the second one, kingdom of heaven, means the place it is located or where it is from. Just like kingdom of Persia means it is from a place called Persia or Babylon. It is that simple. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Heaven shows the place. God shows the ownership, the person. And what is the gospel of the kingdom? right? <laughs> we are we going to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And the simple definition of gospel of the kingdom is God is king. He has a kingdom that he wants to see established on the earth. The very people that God put to realize that dream, we have been deceived by the religious spirit waiting to escape this planet. Can you believe that? Humans were created by God and trusted them with a task. Guys, you establish my kingdom and my will on earth as it is in heaven. I'm giving you access to heaven. You can see what I'm doing and you duplicate that on the earth. Just like Jesus said, I see what my father is doing and I do it on the earth. And we have been deceived by the religious spirit so long. We are just waiting. The church, I'm talking about, not us. You guys are kingdom people. Majority of the church is waiting around singing Kumbaya. Waiting to disappear. What is kingdom age? That's another wonderful question because when the pandemic began, we began to hear from different people, oh, this is the end of the church age. We are entering into the kingdom age. No. It's like the, we separated the kingdom and the church, just like we'd separated the church and the state in the United States. Kingdom and church or ecclesia always work together. One cannot function without the other. If there's the kingdom, 
There is to be an ecclesia. If there is an ecclesia, there has to be a kingdom. Ecclesia cannot live, then the kingdom can come. No. They, have, they came together on the day of Pentecost. Kingdom came, ecclesia was activated into function. So kingdom age means the period of time in which God began to rule this planet with his kingdom. When did that start? When did God began to rule this planet with his kingdom? It started in the book of Genesis. There was not a time on the history of this earth God's kingdom was absent. At least through a person it manifested. Like Abraham, Noah, God accomplished his kingdom assignment on the earth. Like through David, there was a lineage of people that came who did God's kingdom assignment on the earth. But the manifestation of God's kingdom varied from age to age based on one single thing, based on the corporation of mankind with God's eternal purpose. That is the only thing that determine how much kingdom will manifest on the earth, the corporation of mankind. That's why when Jesus told us to, pr to pray, he said, let your kingdom come, your will be done, when? Not 4,000 years from now. Was he trying to cheat us? No. <laughs> he did not put any time limit. Here it is. Jesus told us to pray for the kingdom to come in this manner. Therefore, pray our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. But in parenthesis, he put... 4,000 years later, guys, you start praying now, but it's not for now. No, it is for now. It was for then. It is for now, and it will be forever. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is God's eternal purpose and plan for earth and mankind. Jesus came to give us a kingdom, not a denomination, not a worship center, not a cathedral, not any kind of goosebumps. Jesus came to give us a kingdom because that's what we lost. Jesus said, do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom because God knew we can't live without a kingdom and he was so happy, he was so waiting. He waited for 4,000 years to give our kingdom back, his kingdom back to us. And when the time came, time came, he was so pleased. And that's why the next verse is so important, Matthew 11 verse 12. This is one of the most misquoted verse in the New Testament by church people. It says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now. Everybody say until now. Until now means the time Jesus was talking this. Okay. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. What does that mean? See, John the Baptist was the special human who got the special privilege of announcing about the arrival of the kingdom. That's where Jesus said, there's no man who's greater than John the Baptist who was born of a woman. Why? Because John received the privilege and the honor of announcing about the coming of God's kingdom back to planet earth. His message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is about to arrive on this planet earth. So when people heard that, something began to vibrate in their spirit man. They said, we want kingdom. We want kingdom now. And they want to take it by force, by violence, because it was not made available to them until Jesus came. He came with the kingdom. And that's why he said, little flock, do not be afraid. 
It is your father's good pleasure to give you. You don't need to be violent now. It is being made available to you. When I am so happy to give you a gift, you don't need to grab it. You don't need to become violent. All you have to do is to receive it and say thank you. And that's what God is telling us. It's so, God is so plesh, pleased with us. That means he's so happy to give us his kingdom back. Jesus told us to preach the kingdom. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is the message he told them to preach. He didn't say go and preach about grace. We need grace. He didn't say go and preach something revival. No, go and say kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then Matthew 24, 14, he said, when this gospel of the kingdom, because why did he emphasize this gospel? Because he knew people will come up with all kinds of gospels, prosperity gospel, poverty gospel, deliverance gospel, gospel of grace, and oh my goodness, every denomination, Pentecostal gospel, Baptist gospel, everybody has a gospel. But Jesus said, guys, this particular gospel, gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, not just in Israel, not just for Jewish people, the entire world as a witness in all the nations, and then the end will come. Do you know the good news? This preaching of the gospel of the kingdom has just started. So when a pandemic comes, third world war comes, don't pack your bags. We had to focus on this. When this mission is accomplished, then the end will come. That is the sign we need to be looking for. Not for the temple somewhere to be built. The gospel of the kingdom is it going out. Anybody preaching gospel of the kingdom, help that person. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. And we are going to see evidences of Jesus and the apostles preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So starting with Jesus. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases among the people. Because he was showing by healing people that sickness and diseases were not of his kingdom. That was not his original idea for people. In Mark chapter 1 verse 14, he said, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. That is the message Jesus preached. Then Matthew 24, 14, we already read that. Luke chapter 4 verse 43, Jesus said, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also because of this purpose I have been sent. What is the purpose? God, Father, sent Jesus to preach the kingdom of God to human beings. After the resurrection, Jesus spent 40 days with the disciples. The book of Acts begins with the kingdom of God. And he spent 40 days with the disciples. Do you know what he was talking about? Not church planting, not evangelism. He was talking about the kingdom of God. He had only one subject from the first day of his ministry till the last day before he ascended back to heaven. Jesus Christ had only one subject. And I have only one subject to talk about, which is the kingdom of God. Nothing else whatsoever. And when I travel to other places, when I do conferences, when I teach on conferences, people ask me, Abraham, okay, you preach kingdom, Jesus preached kingdom. Did Paul the apostle preach kingdom because he was the apostle of grace? <laughs> Let me, sorry to disappoint you, the only message that Paul preached during his missionary journeys was the kingdom of God. And I'm going to show you from the book of Acts, five references, Paul's 
own words that he's saying what he was preaching. Ready? We're starting with Acts chapter 19, verse 8 in Ephesus. The Ephesian church that he went to plant. What did he preach in Ephesus? We love, everybody loved the epistle of Ephesus, Ephesian, right? But what was the message he preached to establish that church? He went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, three long months, reasoning, persuading, concerning the things of the kingdom of God. That's what he was doing. Persuading, reasoning with people for three months in Ephesus about the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 14, verse 22, in Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, during their second missionary journey, what was Paul preaching? He called for the leaders of the church, elders of the church, and strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. This entering the kingdom is not going to heaven. It's not something that happens after you die. This is something that needs to happen while we are alive. That's why John wrote about the same thing in, in John chapter 3, verse 5. Until you are born, unless you are born of water and spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Paul taught the same thing, entering God's kingdom. First, do you see the kingdom? Then you enter God's kingdom. Then the third is you inherit or manifest God's kingdom on earth. Acts chapter 20, verse 25. This is Paul's farewell speech to the elders in Ephesus. We used to have pastor's conference. Paul used to have elder's conference. And this is his farewell message to the people that he called. He says, indeed now, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, not rapture, kingdom of God will see my face no more. That was his last words to the churches that he was established. He says, guys, I have gone among you preaching one subject, the kingdom of God, but you will not see my face anymore. Goodbye. That was his final speech. Then in Acts chapter 28, when he was in Rome, what was Paul doing? So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. Paul had only one subject. He preached about the cross. He preached about Jesus within the context of God's kingdom. Then the last verse, book of Acts, end like this. It began with the kingdom. It end with the kingdom, the book of Acts. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence and no one forbidding him. So when there is this many evidences from Paul's own personal testimony that he preached the kingdom of God wherever we went, during his missionary journey, why can't we just do the same thing? Why can't today's preachers just do the same thing? Did things change from apostle to modern apostle Paul to this apostle? No. We have the same message that Jesus left to his apostles. The kingdom of God. The gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, wow. Wow. Peter, did Peter preach the kingdom? <laughs> oh, my Lord, my God, my people of God. What I didn't recognize for a long time when I was under the influence of the religious spirit, 
I couldn't think Peter preached the kingdom on the day of Pentecost. Peter is the smartest preacher. He preached about the kingdom without using the word kingdom. I had to give him a salute when I get to heaven to Peter. Because this Peter entered God's kingdom in one day, what it took me 25 years, what it took 40 years for the people of Israel in the wilderness to enter their promised land, enter God's kingdom. It took them 40 years. It took me 25 years. Peter only took one day. And he left the net, the boat, everything entered, transitioned to God's kingdom from one economy to another economy, one culture to another culture, one religious system to another religious system, from employment to doing kingdom assignment. In one day, he did it. And that Peter, when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, he was not sitting there with a sermon note from three-point sermon downloaded from Google. <laughs> he had no idea what he was going to preach. And this is where... The interesting thing is after he was talking about Joel, book of Joel, about prophecy that he will pour out all his spirit upon all flesh, all of a sudden his focus switched to David on the day of Pentecost. Half of his message was about David. Why? What David was to do with the day of Pentecost and the arrival of kingdom and the inauguration of Ecclesia on this planet Earth. Very much because God made a covenant with David, eternal covenant with David and his house, saying, his throne shall and his kingdom shall remain forever and forever and forever. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that covenant that God made with David by raising him from the dead to sit on David's throne. And when the Jewish people heard that message, they got convicted and they said, oh my God, this is true. And they ran to Peter and asking, what shall we do, brethren? That's when he said, repent. But his message was not about repentance. He preached the kingdom from a historic perspective from their history because the audience that he was preaching on the day of Pentecost where Jewish people came to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost from every nation under heaven. When they heard that promise has been fulfilled, they ran. They said, we want the kingdom of God. That's where Jesus said, from the day of John the Baptist, kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. So here's the verse, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sown with an oath to him, that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, that's where Jesus is called the son of David, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. When did God make that oath to David in the Old Testament? Here is the verse in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 and 16. This is what God spoke to David through a prophet. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever and that's what peter preached on the day of pentecost and i want to tell you a secret every class i will give you a secret okay don't share with anybody else <laughs> no i'm just kidding why did god made this kind of covenant with the man called david what was special about david and we were taught that, we were taught by the religious world because of his music. No, 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 no. There are so many people who played music before that and after that, even now. But David is the first human being on this planet Earth who received a revelation about God 
being a king and having a kingdom. And he began to write about it in the Bible for the first time in human history. And when God saw from heaven, there is one man who understood who I am and my heart. And he said, there is the man after my own heart. I am a king. He is a king. He understands me and my how my kingdom operates. And God made an everlasting covenant with David and his house. That's what made him. My people of God, if you show interest in God and his kingdom being a king, you will, God will never let you down, you and your seed ever after you. I prophesy that over you in Jesus' name. This is not a game that we play. This is serious business playing with God and his kingdom. He is looking from heaven. Is there any man or a woman on this planet earth who understand who I am and my kingdom? I want to partner with that man and that woman. And we have been trying to teach people how to sing for 2,000 years. It is not teaching them about God's kingdom and their assignment in it and their purpose in it and release them to fulfill and make earth like heaven. We could have done this 5,000 years ago. And still people don't believe this. That's my, that is my shocking thing, the deception of the devil. People look at me like, like a deer on the headlight, you know, what? <laughs> and they're skeptic about God's kingdom. God's people, Christians, the very people that he put on this earth to accomplish his will on the earth and his kingdom. And they're still resisting. After this many years that we have lived by, we have a history, we have a long history. And still we are not sure about our purpose. And here's what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1, verse 10 to 12. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How do we enter into God's kingdom? We have to make our calling and election sure. That is an entrance into God's kingdom. And next week when we come back, we will study about the rest of the apostles and how they preached God's kingdom. Father, I thank you for this evening, morning, afternoon, whatever time zone we are in, Father. I thank you for the word. And David is the only man who never lost a battle. I thank you for that same anointing and grace to come upon my brothers and sisters who is watching this class from around the world. The same grace that they will never lose a battle because they are so committed to your kingdom and they give their life willingly to you, my father, for your kingdom assignment. Nothing else on this planet earth, nothing else matters. No success, no leadership, no nonsense. Kingdom of God, kingdom of our father. The very air we breathe is a kingdom property. The land that we walk on is kingdom property. The trees that we look upon, they are kingdom property. And our body is kingdom property. And we give this body to you, Holy Spirit of God, to accomplish your will. And I thank you for this revolution, revelation, transformation. I cancel every assignment of the enemy because of this word in enemy or form. Let this word be planted in our hearts rooted, grounded, bringing forth hundredfold fruit in generations to come in Jesus' name that will put that enemy to flee in Jesus Christ's holy name. And everybody said,
Amen and amen and amen. Lord, my God, that was something else, my brothers <laughs> and my sisters. Whew. That was heavy upon me, actually, to be honest with you. This is heavy stuff. We are not playing with the, we are playing with the big boys. <laughs> kingdom business, when it comes to kingdom business, you get God's attention. I know my brother Nick, he has this dream, my brother. I, brought, I met Nick two years ago, I think, in Denver. My brother, God is in the process of pruning and pruning and pruning and pruning so that you will come to a place that there is no Nick left. Only Holy Spirit and Jesus and his kingdom. And I, go, I had to go through that process, the same very process. I was trying to establish a big ministry, Abraham John's kingdom. I was going to do this. I said, I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to make that happen. And do you know what happened? Nothing happened. <laughs> Until I came to the point to say, it's not about me. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer Abraham John lives, but Christ and for his kingdom. Amen. Nancy, so good to see you, my sister. <laughs> so any question, comments, feedback about what you heard today? Now is the time for it. Please raise your hands, unmute your microphone, and say it, please. Go ahead, Oliver. Um, I'm going to start the word. I'm a little confused, like... You make it so clear. It, it was all the time about this kingdom. Mm. And then you got ministry this, that, and, and they're all doing emphasizing on another part of the kingdom. But it's like, is this, I don't know, I feel like cheated. Why are, aren't all the preachers doing the same kingdom stuff? I, I don't get it. <laughs> the power of religion. Deception. It's called the yeah, deception of the devil, my brother. My Lord, my God. The devil doesn't want anybody discovering God's kingdom on this planet Earth because he wants to keep this Earth for his kingdom. The devil is a liar. Amen. He cheated us in the Garden of Eden. He took the garden from yes. us. He took the right to rule yes. the earth. He took the yes. kingdom from us. And he, and he made yes. us slaves of him for centuries. Yes. Yeah. We have been slaving for his kingdom for hundreds of years without even knowing it. Yeah. Now God's people are waking up. Humans are waking up from around the world with this kingdom. Like I said before, from every day from now, the kingdom is going to be preached more than anything else. Yeah. Even all these big preachers that you hear, they are going to talk about kingdom and they already started. Yeah. Even Dutch Sheets, I just heard him other yeah, day talking I... about kingdom and ecclesia. He was yep, right. I just heard it. He was running around all over America with Chuck Pierce about revival and this and that. Now he's coming back to the kingdom and the ecclesia. Thank God. And I uh, heard Rick Joyner, too. He just announced it last week. Yeah. And Benny Hinn's brother, William Hinn, he's a yeah. kingdom preacher and he's discipling Benny Hinn into the kingdom now. Don't tell that <laughs> anybody else. <laughs> That is an inside information. Don't say yeah. that publicly to anybody else. Hey, but I feel, I feel like, I feel like when you start unfolding this kingdom stuff, I felt like cheated and stupid. Like, from why didn't anyone told me? <laughs> and then once this, this course is unfolding, I feel like really special. Like I'm really a king's kid because now a kingdom is being unfolded. Yeah. It's like it's like hidden in the Bible. It's so clear. But you need someone to like unfold, mm -hmm. you know, what has been hidden actually. Because it's, kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. That's right. That's it, right. It is hidden. Yeah. 
but god has to open our eyes when he opens it oh my goodness then you when you say like you did how could we miss this this law <laughs> it was all the time right there and now it's it's getting it's it's getting unlocked it's it's amazing amen amen thank god for his grace my brother thank amen. god i have a question um Okay, you know, when you talked about in the beginning of the garden, and it said um, there was a, a time when everything was, it, it did itself, like in the garden, they didn't really have to do anything because it was already given to them. They didn't, they yeah. didn't have to have any clothes on or anything like that because they... They hadn't eaten from the tree yet. Uh huh. But do you think that they had a plan in place that God gave them to still take care of the garden? Or yep. did he take care of the garden himself? No, they had to. They had to take care of it. God gave to them. He says, tend it, protect it, and keep it. That's what he told them in Genesis chapter two. Tent means to take care of, cultivate, manage, maximize. And plus he met with them every day to give them daily plan, what they're supposed to be doing. And mm -hmm. every tree in the garden represented a component of God's kingdom. There was tree of life. There was a tree for government. There was a tree for economy. There was a tree for Education, there was a tree for everything in kingdom because in Bible, trees are very important. That's why tree of life. Why would life is connected to a tree? Not, right. the, not the microchip of life was in the middle of the garden, but tree. Trees are symbols of God's kingdom like any person that you see in the Bible, they are compared to a tree. If you study the life of Abraham, yeah, a tree always connected with him, terebinth or oak tree. And Israel is compared as a fig tree. And when he was training Jeremiah, he said, why do you see Jeremiah said an almond branch? Almond represents prophetic gift. Vineyard. Wow. All those things represent something in God's kingdom, every tree. And God met with Adam, like when he, God appeared to Abraham, he says he was sitting by a terrible tree of Mamre. That's where God appeared, just like God used to appear in the garden under different trees, teaching Adam and Eve about his kingdom and what they should be doing. Okay. So do you think that um, when they removed away from the garden, they had different kinds of trees or they didn't have those trees anymore? They had nothing. They had to come up with their own <laughs> plan. Oh, wow. They, they got stranded on the earth. No kingdom. Yeah, no I know food. it said they had to strive, but I thought. Not food, no clothing. But God came and clothed them with the skin of an animal. They were stitching with the leaves of the yeah, tree. Yeah, it says that. I was just thinking when I read the Genesis that it said he provided. But there's so many different Bible interpretations. Like I was studying it. One Bible said that everything they needed was provided for them. But, but then the other one said that they had to rule over the garden so and subdue. So, I mean, it was like, it's four or five different interpretations of how it's written in different versions of the Bible. So that's why I asked. Yeah, in the garden, everything was provided for them. Adam didn't have to wait three months to grow something to eat. His food was ready. Yeah, it was like always there. Yeah. So it's like they really didn't have to seed and plant it was always there. They so it was to, provided. The, the first thing was provided for them. Then they have to grow it. Their plant, their 
assignment was to expand the garden and fill the entire earth and make it look like the Garden of Eden. God's kingdom establishing. That was God's kingdom, the Garden of Eden in manifestation. That's why I said in the class, God came down to plant that garden. Right, I remember you saying that. He's the one who was the first farmer. So they had to subdue in the garden because, oh my goodness, this is too much. You had to read the gospel of the kingdom book. You have it? The gospel. What color is it? It's a blue. I got the, I got the maroon ones, which is the king. No, I don't have that one. Is it is it in that one with the um it is a picture of a globe earth covered in gold it's called the gospel of the kingdom hope for I'm going to look for it because I have those five packets that have the the rings on it with the plastic black pieces I haven't read all them No not those this is a regular size printed book oh, oh. where is it let me show you show me what it looks like this one. Oh. oh no i don't have that one that looks good. Of the kingdom that looks good i'll have to order that one so in this one i explained the pre-adamic history of the earth and why god told adam to have dominion before the fall, to subdue and take care of the animals and creatures before the fall. Okay. There's a reason for it. Or attend the Ecclesia meetings that we have on Sundays. That's what I teach on the Ecclesia meetings. <laughs> okay. Is it? Okay. Well, Nick, my brother. Oh, so are you done, Nancy? Yeah, that was my question. Okay, thank you. Nick, thank my you. brother, say something, please. I want to hear from you. There's something God is speaking to you even today. Something is happening in you. What's happening? Please share with us. <clears throat> no, there's just, uh, there's been a lot happening even prior to starting the, uh, the course of rediscovering the kingdom and i'm going to make a long story very very short but um i had someone that uh, i met in 2015 and we kind of lost track of each other and he called me about um six weeks ago i would say and when when i looked at my phone and i saw that name i'm like I know that person, but I didn't remember when I met him. So I answered the phone and he started asking a couple of questions and, and we were going back and forth, but I still was trying to figure out in my mind, who is this guy? And his name is Jill. And suddenly he started to talk to me about a project that he started in 2016. And he started to talk to me about uh, 1500 acres of land that uh, he was able to, um, to, uh, take uh, part ownership of and it's just really amazing because his entire vision has a lot to do with what I shared with you about two years ago when we met mm. and um, he is uh, he is a um, he's a Christian uh, but really really understands the principles of the kingdom and uh, what he's doing in developing those communities and uh, just Everything from farm mm -hmm. to plate, yeah. everything being uh, self, uh, a self, an ecosystem. And it's just amazing because today you were highlighting the fact of how special, you know, agriculture mm -hmm. and how special the land. Mm -hmm. And it's a project that I've been kind of going no matter what because I have a couple of things right now that are happening in regards to some of my businesses but that's the project that I've really been asking God to give me to I like to me if I should be spending any time right now in regards to that project and mm -hmm. by just being here tonight and you highlighting the agriculture part and how 
the value, you know, that God sees in the land, mm -hmm. it gave me confirmation that um, I got to move ahead with uh, with uh, doing my part in, in, in helping this, this brother. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Sabrina, mm -hmm. welcome. Good to see you. Mauricio, what you're, what you're searching, my brother? I am just reading um, uh, Genesis you know, 2, where it talks about the Garden of Eden and how God placed them there. Mm -hmm. And he... Uh, and he made every tree to grow that is pleasant like in the sight in the, for the sight and it was good for food mm. and then he talks about so like i was just kind of reading that over because that stood out to me when you spoke about it so i just want to read it for myself to see what the spirit is highlighting is going to highlight for me amen and the interesting thing is bible ends where it began in revelation 22 we see the same tree of life planted by the riverside that bears 12 fruit every month, each fruit and whose leaves shall be used for the healing of the nations. See, healing also come through trees. And this is, people say this is the new earth and new heaven, okay? If it is new earth, why do we need healing? Why, why do nations need healing? <laughs> this is Revelation 22, verse 1 through 5. Please read it when you finish this class, you know, or when you get a chance. Revelation 22, because Bible ends where it began. God is in the process of restoring what we lost in, in, in Genesis chapter 2. And 3, there was a disruption came through the devil's deception because he wants to establish his kingdom here on the earth. But Amen. God is through restoring the process. He take us back to that same original plan in Revelation 21 and 22. God doesn't have a new plan. He doesn't have any change of mind. He has the same plan that he started in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 for us. And for the earth, the sooner we align with him in his plan, things will get better for us and for the planet. The more we resist and wait, we are wasting our time. We are wasting our life. How many generations wasted just waiting for rapture to fly out? Like in 1948, when Israel became a nation, all these end-time preachers began to preach, this is the last generation, guys. We are going to be out of here in 40 years. And 1998 was the date they decided this is the year, nothing more. And here we are, 2020. Those generations died and gone. We are still here. And we will be here... <laughs> God has, God has no new plans. He hasn't changed his mind concerning us and the planet Earth. Amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> I thank God for Nancy. She's like a bulldog in, in Minnesota. You know, she's going to get all Minnesota into the kingdom, Nancy. <laughs> We just we just went to a church last week and a pastor. We gave him your book. He's so excited on fire. That's an Albert Lee. Praise God. Yeah, hallelujah. Hey, okay, let's pray. We have our most out of our time. Let's pray for each other that God will make this kingdom. Chinwe, are you still there, my sister? Yes, I'm still here. You are still there. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So let's pray for each other for God to make this kingdom so real to us and our assignment in it without a shadow of doubt. And pray for me. I'm going to Washington, D.C. 
on Thursday to minister at a conference, prayer conference, prayer training conference, Thursday, Friday, Saturday on Washington, D.C. So I need your prayers. So please keep me in your prayers whenever you think of. And uh, um, yeah, that's all I have. I'm in Maryland. So you'll be close to me, Abraham. Oh, come on, visit us in D.C. Where? Uh, it's at a church called uh, Deeper Life. Deeper Life. Life on Sergeant Road. I don't know the number. Sergeant Road. Chinwe might know I'm... more about me, more about than me, Chinwe. She's yes, I, I actually do. Um, if you're interested in going, it's Deeper Life. Is four nine one five. Sergeant Road, Northeast, Washington, D.C. Okay, I'll look it up. Okay. Awesome, um, thank you. You're welcome. If you want me to put it on the chat, I can do that right now. Yeah, that'd um, be great too. Yeah. All right, let me. So Saturday at what time? Saturday's the um, last day. Saturday's ends by yeah. afternoon. Thursday night, Friday, all day Friday, Saturday until afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Let awesome. me. It's usually very good. I attend every year. And um, the only reason why I can't do this year is because I have um, a recertification class and I have class Thursday, Friday, so I won't be able to go. It's very powerful. You will um you will you will like it. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I'm to pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Let's pray for each other, bless each other. Yes, Lord, Lord thank you for the yeah. real to us our assignment. Pray for Nick and his kingdom. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father thank you, God. Leading. Yes, Lord, doing thank you, Father. Each of us, Sabrina, Chinway, Father, Lord, I Oliver, Father, thank, thank you, Lord you. Jesus, for this day. Thank, thank you for this teaching, Father, Father God. Thank you for Abraham and his faithfulness, so Father God. His obedience, Lord, to your word and to your kingdom, Father God. We bless him, Father God. We pray for his neck, Father God, for the pain that he woke up with, Father God. We pray healing over him right now in the name of Jesus, Father God. We declare that your kingdom is here now, Father God. Let your kingdom come, Father, on earth as it is in heaven, Father God. We lift up Chinway, Father God, to you, Lord. We thank you for her life and what you're doing in her, Father God. We pray your divine protection over her life and the life of her family, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for her for her Thank you for hunger that she has to learn your kingdom, Father God. And we just pray that what you have in store for her, Father God, will be revealed to her, Father God. And we thank you for her life. We pray for Nancy, Father God. We thank you for her life. We thank you for her hunger, Father God. For seeking you, Father God, for taking this class, Father God. We just pray that you will reward her, Father God, with wisdom. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for every heart that's here is represented on this call, Father God. We want you, Father God, and we seek you, Father God. So we just ask that you have, that you have mercy you have over us, Father God, and that you will give us kind of insight into your kingdom, Father God, that you will open up our eyes, Father God. We pray for Nick. Father God, we just pray for protection you, over him, Lord, for what you're doing in his life, Lord. We pray for Sabrina, Father God, that you may bless her and keep her in all her ways, Father God, that you open up her eyes even more, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for Oliver, Father God. We pray, Lord, for his, for his heart, Father God, and that you may bless him and keep him, Lord, and that you continue to grow him, Father God. You know, I woke up this morning with a pulled muscle on my neck. Please pray for me that, that when I wake up in the morning, I'll be completely restored. Like one side, I'm tilted my neck to one side because I can turn my neck. Just happened this morning. I went to bed last night. There was nothing wrong. And I woke up this morning. I couldn't turn. I, maybe I slept wrong. I don't know. But please pray, keep it in your prayers in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for this day. Lord, I thank you for delivering us from the religious spirit and its deceptions. Every religious city must go for us to enter into your kingdom, Father. 
and help us to be your children and father relationship in us, daddy and children. We thank you for that privilege. Thank you, Lord, for this class. I bless them. I cancel every assignment of the enemy in any way or form because of this word. I thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory and praise. Thank you for the conference in D.C., Father. Thank you for your glory to manifest people to come and be blessed and transformed and released into your kingdom assignment. We love you. Thank you for this night. In Jesus Christ's holy name, we pray. Everybody said amen. Thank you. This lesson will be uploaded on the YouTube uh, within 24 hours. And uh, uh, it's a, such a pleasure to teach this kingdom to you guys. You guys are so hungry. And that makes easy for me. So thank you for receiving the gospel of the kingdom of God. There's nothing greater in life. So God bless you. I will see you next week.